There we go. We are we're good we're good now. I mean, it's it's, it's only uh, broken you know a few times. That's fine. Um, welcome everybody to the uh, first geek cast in a, a while. It's it's been a while. Um, hi, uh, Gavin, Mindy. Hi. I, I am joined by both of them. Hello. Today. Good evening. Hey guys, welcome back to our geek cast. You're really loud. I just turned you down. Um, so fake Darren is here with us today as well um, because real Darren couldn't make it. Um, he apologizes from the depths of his heart, but he sent us this nice photo, which technically animates, but uh, we don't have the ability to make that happen at the moment. Um, but uh, fake Darren is here with us in spirit. Um, since the topics we're going to be discussing today range uh, from random questions and answers, uh, security, um, some stuff Mindy forgot last time he was talking to you, and uh, well, we're going to cover some some managed stuff maybe at the end. Um, so uh, just in case, um, oh, we have a follower. Thank you. Um, so uh, while we're here. While I'm getting stuff set up on the back end to do something we weren't necessarily prepared to do, um, does anyone have any questions for any of the admin staff? Feel free, all 20 of you, to flood us with all your questions. Um, I I would like to make one quick announcement. Um, the Currently... 99% of the admin staff will be attending Automation Nation, also known as IT Nation Explorer, 2019, um, where we have one individual uh, who shall remain nameless, who is very close to making it happen. So it is a high feasibility that the entire admin team will be present at uh, Automation Nation. So yay, Automation Nation. Uh, I don't see any, like no one um, uh, to invalid selection in the comments. Uh, I get 99% from one missing by doing great math. Um, I, do, I am a developer. Um, so I ran it through some algorithms and made it work. <laughs> Common core math. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good comment. <clears throat> Is that why the Slack bot's broken, Kyle? What? <laughs> <laughs> Is that why the Slack bot's broken? <laughs> Slackbot's wor it's actually working right now, I'm pretty sure. So we had took a poll about what you guys wanted to hear on GeekCast, and the response was a resounding maximum eight people was the highest response that we got. Um, but for the most part, everyone was like, you know, just talk about something interesting and we'll listen, hopefully learn something. A lot of people wanted to hear about security. Um, and I personally had an interest in addressing some of the holes I left behind on the previous key cast I did where, um, uh, I kind of brushed over a lot of the basics and scripting and monitoring, assuming everyone knew or was following along. Uh, and I wanted to brush up on that a little bit. Um, and that's basically how we gathered the topic for this key cast essentially. Um, so to cover the basics of security. Um, there's a few basic points we want to talk about, um, specifically being aware of well, who has access to your data. It's like one of the biggest things, right? That that specifically includes not just internal, but also external. It includes not just, um, <laughs> wow. Way, way to throw us off, Aaron. <laughs> Um, I, mean, includes... I thought you couldn't make it today. <laughs> <laughs> um, it includes things that you don't necessarily think about in terms of when you're giving access to your data. Like when you install a plugin into Automate or any software actually that has sensitive information or ability to do things for your customers, um, you have to think about how everything is linked. So specifically, let's say Automate, you install a plugin. If that plugin is from ConnectWise, hopefully, obviously, you're relying on their security and quality control team, which I can't believe I said with an almost straight face just now. 
to make sure that the plugin is obviously uh, secure and doesn't have any issues. But when you're coming from a third-party plugin, if it's not somebody you know or if the code is hidden, you want to really do uh, your own analysis of that. You know, do your own checks into the plugin, see if anybody else is using it. Um, you want to monitor at least in the beginning what's happening on your server while that plugin's in use. And it, the, the simplest way to do that is to go in your plugin manager and go down the plugins, avoid disabling the ConnectWise plugins because that can have disastrous consequences. <laughs> Look at the ones where the author isn't ConnectWise and determine if you actually need them or not. If you don't, they should be disabled and then fully removed. Sometimes disabling it doesn't necessarily remove it. Um, right. you have, it's like an extra step, uh, which you can do, which will get rid of it completely. If the plugin's set up properly, which most of the time it's not, it will also remove its data tables if uh, or any kind of tidy up, but most of them don't. Most of them don't, yeah. And then you're ending up with a messy database. The other thing you want to think about with these plugins is not just an automate side, but like if you have, so you have to remember to automate themselves from ConnectWise has integration to ConnectWise control and ConnectWise manage and having any kind of integration built for either of those platforms with a connection to your RMM tool uh, gives a pathway or a doorway, so to speak, for a malicious uh, person to take advantage of, uh, of that connection. So you, they can breach your managed system, which you can be like, well, I don't really have anything sensitive in tickets and manage can't do anything with my clients. So I don't really care. But the bottom line is, is that it can manage has an integration and the ability to execute scripts using the automated integration. Um, ConnectWise control obviously is just as devastating. If automate was, was to be compromised, ConnectWise control would be just as devastating. So you want to really understand any extensions or plugins that you're doing. Um, that's, that's installed and it's running. You want to, like Gavin said, you do not want to have any plugin installed that you're not actively using. But if you do not need it, remove it, not just for security, but for performance sake, right? You know, Automate is a fantastic application and it's a fantastic platform. It does not do well with performance. We try to help that along by keeping it as small as possible, small as footprint. Um, and make sure when you disable a plugin, Wait a day or two, see if anything breaks. If nothing breaks, remove it fully. You want to make sure you remove it completely because otherwise the modules are still in the database, the DLLs still get loaded, everything's still running, even if it's not actually doing anything. Um, so yes, plugins is a very, very big thing. Um, next one, I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll take the next one, which is actually, it's a simple one and the lesson here is real easy. If you do not have multi-factor authentication enabled on your Automate and pretty much every service that you are using at your MSP, you are doing yourselves and your company a disservice. It's the simplest and quickest way to secure pretty much everything with minimal effort. If you haven't done that, I'd do it immediately. Agreed. And that also ties into um, don't share passwords. <laughs> I mean, if you have MFA and they get your password, theoretically speaking and on paper, you're secure, but that's not just because you have MFA doesn't mean you can start giving out your passwords, right? You want to make sure your password policies are secure. You want to make sure your people are not sharing those passwords. You want to make sure you don't share those passwords and you want to make sure that those passwords are um, complex enough to be, to be secure and not hackable. Um, a very, very common, uh, I don't know, I guess, thing that's online or common idea is to not think of a password as a password, but think of it as a passphrase. And I do that for myself. I use literally sentences for my passwords because they're easy to remember. I can swap out characters and I just have to remember what those characters I swapped out are, which is easy over time. And you don't have to think about some crazy complex word you thought of, right? Because the, the concept is what's complex for humans is not complex for computers. And what's complex for computers is not necessarily complex for humans. So the idea to use a passphrase keeps the password simpler for a human to remember and makes it more complex to get hacked. You want to make sure you have strong password policies in place, keep your passwords rotating, and to also do not share them out. And of course, protect with MFA because there is no such thing as foolproof security which is the concept that should be pounding in your head every single time you consider any kind of security problem. There is no such thing as foolproof security. You do your best to be more secure than the other guy. And that way you're less attractive as a target. That's the bottom line. 
another simple thing you can do and again this sounds simple if you are sat out there on lab tech 11 um even if you're really sat out there on automate the earlier versions of automate 12 you really should be looking at updating asap for every bug that you know about i'm positive there are many in the background that were resolved from the end of LabTech 11 or through LabTech 11 security fixes that may have just been inserted in. Um, if you're sat on those old versions, you're sat on a huge vulnerability. All it takes is one of those vulnerabilities to get one person onto your server. And I'm pretty sure we can all agree when someone gets onto your Automate server, that's it, game over. Right. I mean, we all know about the uh, you know, the, the MSP that had, uh, all their customers, uh, hit with ransomware because of, uh, an issue. And it wasn't even done through automated. I think it was, it was Kaseya, right? Um, it was a connect wise, it was connect wise plugin for Kaseya. It was an outdated plugin that would, that had been fixed in a later version that they just didn't update the plugin. Um, and, and that, uh, allowed a hacker to get into the Kaseya, the Kaseya RMM platform and roll out ransomware, boom, all the agents. And you know, you walk in Monday morning and all, all your customers' data is gone. Um, so you really you really want to be aware and on top of these updates and security things. And I, I actually posted an article uh, in, in um, MSP General a couple weeks back about a blogger who posted regarding people who would not upgrade from Windows XP. Uh, it was a very, very blunt article uh, basically says that, you know, and it, and it's accurate that for people who are not able to, who are willingly and purposely not updating, they're doing a disservice to the customer and they're in the environment in general, the, the IT environment, because you become an infection point where you, that computer or, you know, that security hole can be used and exploited to either, you know, uh, run as a, as a, as one of the, Wow, my words are slipping from here right now. Um, a master computer, right, where it, where it can be used as part of the botnet, or you know anything like that, which can be sitting on a network full of Windows 10. But if Windows 10 has a vulnerability that would have been protected otherwise, except Windows XP is the entry point, you know, then you just compromised your entire network. Any kind of healthcare software running on Windows XP, you know, <laughs> should be shut down because that's not secure. Um. To focus on Racket Ralph's question, which was uh, about Kavsto, that does not help with the third-party integrations. No, it doesn't. Um, there's an inherent risk with any integration that you put in. You're kind of weighing the risk up of something happening there versus the benefit of having that in the system, which is why the more integrations you have, the more risk you have, and you just have to balance that, really. Um, a lot of the integrations that I use, and there's not a lot, I've decompiled the code myself and I've looked through it to see if I can see any obvious security threats and that's just me taking the best steps that I can to my ability. I'm, I'm not really a developer. I can script and that kind of stuff, but I do, I do my best to be as astute as I can with those third party integrations. Um, also periodically go through your, lab tech users, uh, sorry, your automate users, I should say now, um, and make sure that people that don't need to be there are deleted. It's a simple thing to do, but I, don't, I reckon it's very easy to lose track of who you've let in. Right. The last thing we want to talk about is what ports are open to your automate server. This is a big one um, because a lot of people use uh, 3306, right? Direct MySQL which is the 3306 is actually the default MySQL port for clients to connect to. Um, and the bottom line is, is like the old lab tech 10, 11, et cetera. Like the normal way to connect was over 3306 unless you're outside. And then the normal way to connect is HTTP. Um, neither of those are okay at this day and age. We want to actually, Kyle, are we ready to share a screen? Uh, I'm in the process of doing that now. So, um, Not yet. I mean, Maybe I've been I've been fighting dropping frames for, for, since since we got in, so I just now got it stabilized to the point to where I can start uh, 
doing it. Go ahead and uh, share it. Um, if it breaks something, I'll just it, we'll figure it out. So I want to share my screen and basically show you the logon page for the Automate, which is the page that all of you should be familiar with, hopefully, because your Automate closes every 48 hours or 24 hours, unless you did or some bad things. Minutes. Or every 15 minutes when it runs out of memory. Mm. <laughs> uh, all right, how do I share my screen? Give me one second. Uh, this one. And hide that. Okay. So I don't know what you can see. Um, Nothing yet, actually. Uh, it looks okay on my end, but I'm not sure if it's fine on yeah. the stream yet because it's not caught up. Well, I haven't. I I can't see anything yet. So. Um, I don't. I don't see your screen, Mindy. It's presenting on Zoom. Yeah, I don't. I don't see it. <laughs> okay, okay, hold on. Found it. There we go. Do you see it now? <laughs> Give me a second. Ah. <laughs> I mean, uh, we're, while we're working through that technical issue. I want to point something streamers. very simply out that you can do that is really easy. Do not give your automate URL or your control URL out to anyone. I've thought about this in the past. I'd actually rather have someone had my admin password than my automate URL. And I'm relatively serious about that. Cut it out of screenshots, cut it out of any anything you paste. Leave it as private as you can. Make it as obscure as you can as well. If you've got the ability to do that, as in most of us haven't because we're kind of committed with what we've got. <laughs> so, I mean, Gavin's correct. Like, we never know what bugs we're going to find or what, what's going to come up in the code that's always changing in the ConnectWise Automate application. Like, they're releasing patches, uh, you know, once a month, generally speaking. And sometimes things that come through that are not caught until afterwards. I was saying. <laughs> okay, I think we're good now. Yeah, I think we're good. Yeah, we're good. Are we good? I see the bar moving. Can you guys hear us now? <clears throat> People uh, say they got disconnected. Um, Silence like a cancer. We are back. Yeah, we're good. I told you we were back. It just takes them a second to realize we're back. Hello, Meta, my old friend. <laughs> We've come to ban you once again. <laughs> All right. Basically, uh, my long rant that got cut off somehow, somewhere along the line that I forgot where I was saying yep. is agreeing with Gavin, do not give out your automate URL or control URL if you can, because you never know what someone can do with it um, until it's too late and you don't want to know. So just hide it as much as possible. If you look at the screen that I'm sharing right now, you'll notice I actually have automate running uh, not three times, just twice. Uh, th this one is the web browser, automate web app which is the term we coined. This is the login page, second instance running of Automate. You are able to run multiple instances of Automate. I don't recommend doing it for heavy use on both sides because Automate has enough memory issues as it is. But you can, if you need to like open up a script and reference computer, you can do two instances at once. Um, on the logon screen specifically, if you pay attention to the server URL, this is where things happen in terms of what port is in use. Everybody obviously knows HTTP is a unencrypted, non-secure port. Any traffic you send, including your password, your username, can be sniffed out, captured, and looked at. And it's not hard. It's extremely easy. Um, everything's plain text. So do not use HTTP. Set up a SSL certificate onto your Automate server. By now, it's a requirement. It does not have to be... Uh, a third party signed, but it should be because it's not hard. 
<laughs> um, make sure you use HTTPS. If you do not specify either HTTP or HTTPS and you just do the host name, uh, what you'll notice under the advanced over here is this port becomes an option. What this is doing is this is connecting over direct MySQL. You can put an IP address, you can put a host name, it doesn't make a difference. It's going to connect over direct MySQL uh, to connect to the Automate server. Um, this is something you don't want to do because much like HTTP, the traffic that occurs from MySQL is not encrypted. Every query, every login, every string that gets sent across is in plain text and can easily be looked at through a sniff traffic. So you don't want to set this. You don't want to change anything over here. All you're going to do is add HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash into not like that. just not like that. Right. There you go. Into still wrong. No, it's there you go. See, that's what I was waiting for. Notice the port is blanked out. 3306, you can no longer specify that port because it knows you're going over HTTPS. It's port 443. You're not allowed to specify a port. It's hard-coded. And that's how you log in. If you do HTTP, it's going to be 80, obviously, but you don't want to do that either. And once you actually have LabTech open or Automate open, if you look at the title bar, um, it will specify how you connected HTTPS or HTTP or neither, which would be a direct MySQL connection, which is bad. Now, in an ideal world, you do not want 3306 open even from outside the Automate server directly. You don't want 3306 open. Um, if you're, okay, so if you're in a split server, obviously you need to have the application server talking to the database server. But aside from those, there is absolutely no reason for any client to be able to connect to your database server over MySQL 3306. If you use SQL Yoga on your computer, then that's your call and that's an exception. In a, um, regardless of whether you do that on the Automate server, from the public firewall, you should never, ever have 3306 open because A, that's, port, I mean, port scans will pick that right up and a brute force script will easily get into a password. And the MySQL connection that occurs has nothing to do with lab tech and has everything to do with just the MySQL engine and there's no MFA. So, and two things to point out as well in regards to that, um, 3306 is going to disappear as an option anyway in an upcoming patch. Uh, in June, I believe. Yeah, patch so six, I think yeah. you are doing yourself a disservice if you're connecting over that because certain things don't work properly when you exactly. do, um, and you'll get better performance if you don't go over that. Right. And that's just the wrap up of, of, of that port that we were just going to go through. But yeah, you'll notice like if you do, if you are connecting over 3306, the hardware tab on the computer screens will not work and other areas of the control center will not work. That ConnectWise has decided to deprecate the ability to connect over port 3306 rather than actually fix those issues because you should not be using 3306 to connect anyways. Um, so as of patch six, like Gavin said, uh, port 3306 will be disabled from use and you will not be able to uh, connect to that. I just remembered, um, just, just to touch back on secu security for a very quick period before we go on to the next part. If you have the ability, you should be doing geographic IP blocking on your firewall, your external firewall to your automated control servers. Um, most of you are going to be in the US. Um, really, there's no need unless you've got clients outside the US to open up those borders on your firewall. Um, I have pretty much everything other than US and the UK blocked. I reckon that cuts out a hell of a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes people go on holiday and you can't connect to them, but it stops all of that kind of brute force attempting that goes on from uh, the non. Right. And I think Germany is required for TeamViewer, but I don't know. I don't remember which, which one. It was a weird country. We did GIP filtering and then we got a call like, oh, TeamViewer stopped working. It's because you're using TeamViewer, pal. Yeah, I mean, that's what I said, but you know, I had to open up the IP address anyway. <laughs> Uh, so I'm not telling you who's. I, I think. Is. Someone, I think that was everything. Asking. Kyle, were you saying something? Yeah, uh, someone's asking in Twitch chat who Smart Dog is, uh, and uh, I refuse to answer that. Okay. Um, 
So, but uh, basically I would learn from this little snippet is make sure my username is admin and my password is password. Yes, that is the way to get hacked and also lose all your clients and your job. They're not my ever, clients. Ever, ever work in the IT community again. Probably. Just this community. I could go to another one. <laughs> <laughs> There's like, what, 50 RMM platforms? Come on Look, now. Look, Kyle, if you have MFA on, you're good, okay? <laughs> Unless you have the auto task Slack, three members and an admin. <laughs> Does Autotask have a Slack? No, but we should. We read. We, it's do. It's MSP Geek. It's the auto test. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. MSP Geek. Yeah. Well, so Kyle, that's you're all fired there too. Come in. We'll make a channel for him. Yeah. <laughs> um. But. Uh, so. Moving uh, on. Yeah, moving on. Um, everyone uh, now knows how to hack Mindy's lab. So. Yes, I, I know. I, I I know. I just agreed with Gavin about hiding your URL. Um. All I can say is good luck. Uh, That's all. And if you do get in, let me know, and I'll give you a prize. Mandy, the worst thing that you can do to an IT community is say something just, like that. Because, you know what? I just did it. Let's go, guys. Ten, ten people um, hour, the, the loading up a, a tab in Chrome. You know, guys, if my screen sharing crashes and someone started a DDoS attack on me. Uh, it only costs 15 bucks, and it's available from pretty much anywhere. So There you go. Um, his password is, in fact, password1. So, uh, log in, uh, feel free. It's quite easy. All right. What's next on the agenda? <laughs> <laughs> next on the agenda. Um, oh, we're we so, going over Mindy's, uh, horribleness and as being an instructor. Oh yeah. Is that what happened? It was pointed out to me that, uh, when we did the remote monitor, uh, geek casts last time, Obviously, it was last week because we do these geek casts every week, right? Every Wednesday, every, every, other, every other Wednesday, every other week, every every other Wednesday. So, so two weeks ago, we did a geek cast. I think we've done more this uh, year than we did last year, so we're already on a roll. <laughs> that uh, I did. I was the idea of the cast was to show off remote monitoring, right? And and um, how powerful it is, and how to apply it to groups and, and searches, which I did to an extent, but I also jumped right into advanced remote monitors and spent a majority of the time focusing on the PowerShell, which is not something that's bad because PowerShell extends the flexibility of the remote monitors, but there's more to a remote monitor than just that. You don't have to turn everything into a PowerShell script. Um, so we want to cover what options you do have in terms of remote, you know, other, other remote monitor settings and things you can look for. Um, so this is my lab, obviously. Um, most of my agents are offline, probably because someone's trying to hack them. Me. But we can pick a my file server. Let's open that up. And I don't know if you remember, if you were on the last cast, but basically the golden rule I follow when creating a remote monitor is always create it on a single computer first and then move it to the group that you want after it's done and working. Because the remote monitor deployment is not necessarily instant. And if you realize you want to make a change to that monitor after you deploy to a group of a thousand agents, you have to wait until all agents get that deployed monitor before you try and changing it. Otherwise, what will happen is you will set up a second revision of that monitor before the first revision gets installed, and you'll run into a bug, which as far as I know has not yet been fixed, um, that will prevent the monitor from installing correctly. So to keep things simple, uh, create the monitor the way you want on a single machine, wait for it to do exactly what you need, and then you can just move it to a group after the fact. Depending on what kind of monitor that is as well. Um, if it's a PowerShell monitor, I'll tend to go onto the crappest servers and try it on that first, primarily the small business servers, Mendy. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. Down with SBS. Ooh, yeah, you, running... you want to do this right now on the Keycast? Yes, because SBS <laughs> is horrible. Uh, they are running PowerShell 2, um, and if you can get it working in PowerShell 2, it will work in the rest of them. Right. Um, yes. Um, a lot of things in PowerShell work in the later versions and don't work in the early versions. So I But hopefully no one's on SBS because it's discontinued um, and no longer supported or maintained by Microsoft. Go, going back to the PowerShell monitors <laughs> for a quick second, <laughs> ignoring Kyle, um, the, the other tip is when I build out a PowerShell remote monitor, you start off in full PowerShell on the console. Make sure you got the command working fine. After you have that working, move to a command prompt calling the PowerShell interpreter. 
And then once you have that working, use it in the command prompt through LabTech, which is going to be the closest you're going to come to actually running the remote monitor live in order for you to see what's going to go wrong. Um, you'll get feedback correctly. You'll see all the output, not just some of it cut off. Um, and you'll be able to adjust for escape characters if you need them, change your quotes, or you know determine what's different when now that it's running under system profile versus what's running under your own profile. A good um, example of that is whenever you try doing invoke web requests and it requires advanced parsing, right? So it uses the Internet Explorer engine, which requires that you had run Internet Explorer at least one time, which is never done under the system profile. So the workaround is to add the use basic parsing into the invoke web request command or set up a registry key to bypass the first config wizard for the system profile. Either way, when you set up your remote monitors and you're building out your PowerShell, start on the console first, directly on the machine, using the lowest version or even the most common version you have deployed. If you don't care about, let's say you don't care about 2008 R2s, right? Or PowerShell 2.0, so then just go to the next one that you do care about, your largest uh, PowerShell version that's deployed. Um, build it out there, and then once you have it working, flip to command prompt, make sure it works, and flip to system profile command prompt. Now with some of the later updates to ConnectWise Control, you are able to do it interactively from backstage, which is where I primarily go nowadays instead of waiting for the command prompt on LabTech. It is a godsend. Um, Without getting into the complexity of the actual command to do that, the all you need to remember if you take anything away from this for a PowerShell monitor is exclamation mark, PowerShell remote monitor in Slack. It'll give you instructions. It'll give you the command that you need to put in. I can never remember it. That's exactly where I go to, to get that. And um, make sure to do this. And I just modify it as I need. PM to yourself. PM to yourself, yeah. So just at yourself. <laughs> yeah. And then click on um, your name and do direct message and then do it, the command in there. Yes. And if you if you forget the uh, exclamation mark command that Gavin just spat out, uh, just do exclamation mark help and it will be listed on there. And again, as Kyle mentioned, you want to talk to Slackbot, generally speaking, to yourself. Go into your own PMs and talk there to yourself. Slackbot listens there. Do not try sending messages to Slackbot directly. It will not work. And if you do it in the channels, uh, especially if there's an ongoing conversation going on, you will just annoy people around you. And we like to not annoy people when and we're not an annoying mood. As, as a side note, to make sure do it in an idea machine um, channel. <laughs> that'll work. Do it in idea machine. <laughs> there's also a channel called uh, Bots and Things. You can do it there too. It's generally empty. Um, so, uh, just uh, and as a side note, if someone is new uh, or someone you don't recognize his name. Uh, do not berate them if they do happen to post help or something, even if it's more than once. Slightly educate them and be nice. It's very easy when you when you get advancing in lab tech and you go on and on and on to kind of get a bit elitist around some of the simple questions. But there's a constant churn of new users coming into Slack and people exiting um, to go elsewhere when they move jobs but we what one of the the most important thing in our community is that the, those people who are coming in feel welcome um and one of the facets of that is having them be able to ask whatever questions they want without judgment and if they do post something that is maybe a security related issue that they don't necessarily get jumped down on their throats educate and teach don't criticize. Yeah, and you know, it's just you know, we want to create a community that everyone, even if because everyone has bad days, they may be trying to fix a critical issue. Um, you know, like they may have been hacked because they released their URL and told everybody to go attack them. Um, <laughs> they may be in the community and having a rough day. I don't know who would do that. That sounds um, not very so, smart. And we don't know how everyone's day is going. And there, there's an, a massive influx of people. We're at uh, almost forty-one hundred uh, individual accounts in Slack itself, which is an amazing number. Um, I don't recall if we sent out a message when we hit four grand um, to thanking the community for, for joining us. But um, it, uh, it is, it is an amazing community we've developed here and we want to continue to develop that as we've said multiple, multiple times. 
Um, and we want to create and foster growth um, and not shove anyone down. Uh, so we just want to make sure to, you know, if, if you happen to upon someone, um, always make sure that uh, you reread what you type because it, it, just like an email, it, all, it you know, you never know how it comes across because it's text, which is which is why I put a bunch of emojis and exclamation points. So what I think might be a good thing to do now is just to see if we can get some feedback from people on what they actually would want to see in monitoring um, in terms of what would you like us to discuss? So um, this, this definite, but now and we're also trying to uh, broaden our horizons as we stare at Mindy's computer continuously. Um <laughs> broaden our horizons uh with not just the content we cover with automate but with the other platforms as well um and even maybe have discussions business-wise for straight msp issues um or solutions that you may have to problems we're open as a community and we're open um to, to to really discussing anything i mean we're all individuals we all have different roles in our companies um and we don't mind stepping on each other's toes and <coughs> telling Mindy how horrible he is uh, challenging the IT community like he's done um, and making sure that we include everyone, um, especially discussions that you may not be interested in, but someone you work with may be interested in having. Um, we, we want to encourage that. Um, we want to encourage the growth of just the community itself. And, and because we all touch several parts of the businesses and we all touch um, you know, multiple things outside of the suite itself. So, so moving on to the actual stop rating the community for things that it didn't do yet. Is, um, is it doesn't look like it. it doesn't look like anyone's actually posted any kind of feedback request of what they want to see on a remote monitor. You have an IIS monitor down, Mandy. Yes, I noticed that. So that's actually perfect. Let's start with the IS monitor. It's down. Let's take a look at what that type of monitor is. These are these are canned monitors that are created either through the solution center or um, LabTex roll detection, Ignite. I know the horrible word everybody cringes when you hear. Um, I personally actually like Ignite, even though I'm not fully using it. And I think it's a fantastic idea, just not necessarily implemented fully correctly. Um, but then again, that kind of applies to everything. <laughs> Moving on. Um, so if you look at the configuration for the type of monitor that we have here, um, and actually you can actually see that it's, that there's a specific type for IS website up down or IS current connections or exchange managed avail availability. These are different types of monitors that automate can do natively with very minimal input on your end. Um, and basically, when you go to create the new monitor, like you have two options, right? Create monitor via wizard or create monitor. They're both going to take you to the same place. Monitor wizard is going to do a uh, walk you through step by step. But these options that you have here are going to be the same options that you just saw in the drop down when you actually open a fully completed monitor. Um, note that there is a difference between a remote monitor and an internal monitor and a system monitor. A remote monitor is a monitor that executes on the agent itself. Because we're inside of a computer screen and we're doing a monitor from the computer screen from an agent, we're only going to see remote monitor options at this point in time. Um, and that's fine because that's what we're covering, but just keep that in mind in general. If you're looking for internal monitors, it's not going to be on the computer screen. And this wizard will walk you through monitor bandwidth. Uh, you put in the device IP address, the SNMP information, and what you want to monitor uh, for that interface that you want to look at. And that monitor will flag like anything else. If you do without the wizard and you create a monitor, you get the same screen as if the monitor was fully created hey, and you can configure it like the advanced version, so to speak. I need to address something um, that's super important. Say it again. Uh, smart dog, uh, no one has ever configured SNMP OID checking for remote monitoring because it's horrible. Continue, Mindy. Um, I, I can tell you that we actually monitor for SNMP through LabTech, but we don't actually use LabTech's SNMP functionality to do it. 
Makes sense. We run an SNMP executable and do a remote executable power uh, monitor that executes and pulls back the results and then flags. Uh, similar to our PowerShell remote monitor, but that's how uh, we don't please. actually use the SNMP functionality through the probe on LabTech. So I can't comment on that. Uh, Smart Dog would like you to show him how to do that. Um, as someone who, uh, I, I know since I'm uh, it's very difficult to, to properly form how I want this. Um, just, just continue. I'll just skip it. Okay. The moment has passed. In terms of seeing an example of how that's done, if you hit me up afterwards, I it's can Martin. post it. It's Martin. Martin is smart dog. He's the one asking you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I figured you'd known that. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right. Anyways, moving on. Uh, to pick up on just a question that was asked before that one, um, has anyone done any monitors to monitor Screen Connect server and monitor any errors in the application on the server? Uh, one thing I want to put in there that's uh, what I call a quick win. Um, I don't trust implicitly Lab Tech Automate to monitor its own ability to be up. So I use uh, uptimerobot.com, which is free. It checks my endpoint for RMM. It checks my endpoint for Screen Connect every five minutes. And to be honest, I know my Automate is down most of the time from the email that that sends out rather than anything that's actually triggered in Automate. Yes. It's free. You can set it up. And I also have our company site in there and a few other things. I think you get 50 monitors for free on there. Um, it works. So we actually use uh, DNS Made Easy. Um, it provides failover DNS so that we, we can bounce our automate URLs and screen connect or connectorized control URLs back and forth across our dual LAN, regardless of, I mean, based off whether or not one is up or one is down. And we get emails in the event of an outage. So we can see, hey, uh, one of our WANs just died, or hey, the server is down because both WANs just died. Um, and it's basically the same thing. Like we, we usually know from the emails from DNS Made Easy faster than we know from the automate server itself. Um, so yes, you, you do want to generally monitor your ConnectWise infrastructure with something other than ConnectWise. Just because putting all your eggs in one basket um, is not a very good idea, generally speaking. And, and you want a lesson that Microsoft have not learned yet. The amount of time their <laughs> services have gone down and the status page hasn't worked is amazing. Well, it's always in a degraded state. If they just mark everything as degraded, then they're never wrong. <laughs> Something is always degraded wrong. somewhere. You're not wrong. Um, but uh, so you can continue with monitoring or I can switch to my screen and we can do some managed stuff. <sighs> Manage. Well, I mean, we uh, have to discuss. Let's go by feedback, guys. What do you want to do? You want to see managed or do you want to see something else? We have, or do you want we to continue have to monitors? broaden the content. Uh, yeah, just, just mon monitors or manage in either Slack or or the oh, uh, Twitch chat. Uh, GSLB. I don't even know what that is, but we'll do it. What is GSLB? I don't know, but we're going to do it. It's better than watching you do monitors again. Uh, well, while we're waiting for those responses, Mendy, one thing that I think a lot of people miss that you can do with a remote monitor is target the alert at a different client. Um, yes. I'll give an example of where that can be used. Let's say you wanted to monitor your client's web pages through a PowerShell script. It wouldn't really make sense to do a PowerShell script that runs on every single one of your remote agents at your clients. So I have all of those running on one agent, and I use where Mendy is now in the alert target to change to an assigned computer that exists at another client. Basically what that means is although the website check is working on one agent, it will actually alert as if it were another agent, allowing you to run multiple remote monitors on one agent and alerting on individual clients. Forrest Gump, you are correct. We are, this is, this is, yeah, we, you can talk in the Twitch chat or you can talk in the GeekCast channel inside of our Slack group. Um, we'll answer out of both. So, uh, it, 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 we watch for both because not everyone has a Twitch account. So it, for those who want to talk in either one, you know, there's conversations going on in both. So um, we handle it in, in, in both. If you have questions, you can ask either one. Um, but since no one has responded, I'm just taking the initiative and doing what I want. 
<laughs> so handing off the screen capture to uh, screen share to Kyle, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. It's it, it's now broken everything. Everything is broken. Apparently, uh, GSLB is global server load balancing, and it's a Citrix thing. That is a surprise, Martin. <laughs> oh, the Twitch, yeah, the Twitch thing is all broken now. It's it's fixed. I fixed it. It's just taking a second to reload. It's just Gavin's face. Gavin likes to be on on TV. Uh oh. Let's see what let's see what this does. All right, that went away. See all your bookmarks. Oh no. Uh, to answer Forrest Gump's question, um, we do have a Python fan, and me? he's currently me. I there you go. Oh, I, he wouldn't even let me finish the sentence. He's Literally just so excited all the time. Pi- hey, look. Let, let me let me let me let me fix this real quick. <laughs> oh, whoa! Uh, you might want to hide all your passwords. I see your Slack web root, webhook secret, and your admin lists, UIDs. Just oh. hide all that. This is Slackbot. I mean, if they could hack in and alter the code and change oh, your yeah. UID. You, you know what? One challenge I think tonight was enough. Tell you what. We don't need to challenge the community again. If 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 you want to uh Yeah, 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 go ahead. If you want to <laughs> hack into my computer and my code oh. and alter the code to have your user IDs that I hopefully won't notice. Uh That's great. Are you actually broadcasting right now? I don't see no, it on the Twitch. It's not on Twitch. Uh, come on, oh. I'm not Mindy. So the screen's not being shared. We're making comments like the screen's shared. Yeah. So if people who don't funny. understand what's going on, Kyle actually opened up the source code to Slackbot. Not to, um, to, to Spoonbot. Not to Slackbot. It's very you need to. I'm not that. Not good. Slackbot. Sorry, to Spoonbot. Um, and is currently displaying all the secret secrets. All the secrets, secret including sauce. our Slack API key and other um, stuff that should not be yeah, on screen. Uh, we've all frozen on video on the Twitch stream. Uh, I've, yeah, I've we have. frozen in seemingly what looks like a semi-sound. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can see half your forehead. And Darren is ever present. This is worth it. This is so worth it. And, uh, Darren, Darren's camera result. froze a long time ago. Uh, it just matches everything else. Um, I, I don't know if it'll be fixed. That's yeah, right. well, Kyle's the only one who's actually moving around. So, that's, you know, that's if Kyle I'm actually important. stares his screen, then then we can we can hide the maniacal look on Gavin's face. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Darren's normal, f- or that's uh, that's everyone's normal face. What are you talking about? <laughs> Darren just stares off in the screen. Gavin just looks longingly <laughs> towards to, towards Darren, going, oh, "Why isn't my code working? Tell me, Darren." And it's just Mindy's forehead. Yeah, that's all you guys need to see. And the mouse that's got like uh, the old style Windows 95 when it crashes. Hey, mine's got the same too. What on earth is going on here? The trail. Mm. All right. Uh, I need to move this window over here. That's my pooping so face I, 100%. So I can see that. Um, um. Uh, that's my uh, <laughs> you are not number one in the queue face. <laughs> yes, yes. There you go. <laughs> What do you mean I'm number two in the queue? <laughs> All right. We're watching the manage. We're, we're on the manage screen now. Well, in a second on the Twitch stream, we will be, but. Um, Hopefully audio hasn't died. It shouldn't. Nothing has literally changed. Except, the, oh, there we go. Manage screen is live on Twitch. All right. So uh, this is our super secret uh, manage instance. Um. Today I will be demonstrating how to properly utilize Manage. I, I don't challenge any of you to try hacking this URL. It is hosted by ConnectWise, and we do not want that content. Uh, if you if you do that, that is your choice. Uh, we do not condone it. Um, so, Forrest Gump, if you go to our YouTube channel, there is an API discussion that utilizes Python. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, that uh, demonstrates how to utilize the CW API um, to interact inside Python with it to do things. It was actually a really interesting geekcast we did. Um, it basically looks at automates computers, finds the assigned contact, and assigns the computer configuration item inside Manage based off the contact of the ticket. Uh, and if there, yeah, it uh, so it would look at the ticket, 
find that it did not have a machine attached, look inside automate, see what user was logged in to that machine and automate, and then auto attach that machine inside manage. <coughs> because that's a feature that's important that manage should have, but doesn't. So, let's look uh, Forrest at... Forrest Gump, are you referring to the GUI base features in Automate or Manage? Oh my god. Thank you, Mark. You have just... <laughs> you have just... Um, highlighted that, a, a good thing for he's basically Forrest Gump saying in the Slack channel he's referring to automate uh, his question was do any right. of you guys ever reverse engineer any of the GUI based features e.g. creating a new client and setting permissions I'd rather do it via command line the best place that you're going to be able to do that is in the automate rest API which is developing each and individual patch there's already a lot of stuff in there um I've started a PowerShell module to do certain things in there, but the REST API is open to do pretty much loads of things like create, add, remove any kind of object in Automate. And that's constantly being worked on, so that's probably worth looking into. Um, so, so, Kyle, what are we going to be seeing here in Manage? Why don't you give us a quick overview of what so this is manage. Manage is amazing. It's better than uh, any other PSA platform um, that you may or may not know. Um, way better than Autotask. Um, so much better, in fact, that uh, I highly encourage you to switch if you're on it. Um, but we're we're currently looking at the service board list inside of Manage. So if you have the permission sets, you have access to setup tables, and currently you can manage everything about 99% of everything you'd need to inside the uh, web interface. Um, I think there's, oh, they did move the accounting interface um, into the web client. So uh, everything that you'd want to do, you can do in the system section if you haven't set anything up. Um, like I said, this is, this is a brand new instance for MSP Geek itself. This is for us to do what we're doing now, demonstrations on um, how to use it, how to work it, everything like that, so we don't um, compromise our company's um, URLs or passwords or users or clients or anything like that. Um, and so this is this is like uh, basically they installed it a couple months ago, and we haven't done anything um, uh, to it. Um, Forest, uh, if as far as management goes, um, if you want to, you, if you're working on the REST API, you can do uh, Postman. It's an app you can use that'll help you test it. Um, the ConnectWise document sites for ConnectWise Manage is amazing. For ConnectWise Automate, it's not so good. Um, it's also out of date. Very out of date, but... Uh, By about six patches. Uh, just look at Gavin's face if you uh, have any questions about how don't, good don't, to automate. Don't, don't trigger me. Don't. No, I'm just saying, look at your face up there in the in the Slack channel for how good the Automate API is. Um, oh, I was looking at the Manage API documentation when that uh, screenshot was taken. How <laughs> <laughs> much you wish Automate API's <laughs> documentation was like that. Um, oh, so funny. Uh, but uh, so they... <clears throat> so this is, our, this is a brand new setup. Um, and we eventually want to run through a how do I do this um, for automate and for manage, um, as far as setting everything up and working it and starting a business with manage tools, um, as if you've never utilized them before, um, and getting set up and getting it working. Uh, some of the most important things you'll look at are the service desk service boards. So you can see, um, how everything's laid out. Um, uh, this is a relatively new feature. You can select all the service boards or just one or two, which is great. Um, Oh my God! Someone's keyboard, please. Only I can have a clicky clacky keyboard. I think that was That's louder that. than the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. I should say meteor. It, it's the same. It, it'd be all the same. It was an asteroid at one point in time. Um. But uh, stop 
notifying me. You want me to switch to full screen? I'll switch to full screen for you. Is that better? You could just said, hey, can you switch to full screen? Yeah, you know, I thought about that when he said, oh, stop notifying me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's, you have a voice. You can use it. Um, but the service board will allow you to, you know, manage your tickets and your workflows and, and, and how your, your engineers work. Um, uh, you can go through and set up how your companies work and how your sales team works through opportunities and how your project staff works through its project board and its workflows. Um, Gavin, you reloading your profile pic reloaded my entire Slack. I just want to let you know that. Um, Glad to be of service. So. Anytime. It, it, it changed the profile pic, which is good. So, uh, but uh, this manage will give you the ability Oh, we, we, we all, <laughs> we all want to like do a shout out to, um, Martin Kyer, community creator and his ability to send notifications at the most awkward times. That was perfect. <laughs> oh, God. Martin, I love you. Oh, good times. Good times. Um, but, uh, so we're going to go through and set up from step one on how to do manage, how to do an automate and how to link them together and how to make them work for your business and for our business. And, uh, it, we're going to try to do it on a YouTube series. So it's, uh, easy to follow. Um, and you can kind of jump around to what topics we discuss when we discuss them. Um, but, uh, for those of you who haven't looked or messed with manage, this is, this is it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's honestly a really nice program. It does have its uh, hiccups and issues, um, but if we were to compare the stability and, uh, featureness and feature richness of the application manage is light years ahead of automate. Um, I've had very few issues, uh, with manage. Um, and I can count the issues I've had with automate today, uh, over manage in its lifetime. Um, so, but, uh, Kyle, I'm, I'm relatively, <clears throat> We are using Manage in our organization. Uh, we're in the process of implementing ticketing. We, we already have our billing and other stuff going through their configurations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I, I can throw you a few questions. Uh, sure. If I'm happy to answer any questions stab at answering anyone them. ever has. How do you avoid overloading engineers with how the tickets look and feel? In manage if you actually go into a ticket and look at how much shit is in there it's just, <laughs> it's a lot it's a lot um and that's my first question so uh it's it's entirely organizable and how whoever wants it can have it um and my philosophy is uh i only want to know basically these this information um, I don't even want to know the initial description because I don't care because it's in the notes section. Um, I have the ticket information on the right. I have the company information on the left and I have the discussion tables in the middle. I don't care about anything else. Nothing else I really care about. If I want to scroll down and see, uh, I might want to know um, if anyone else is attached to this. Um, resources and where'd it go? Oh, it did go up here. Um, the send notes is email. So I, I mean, in case either the contacts checked and not or not checked. Or if there's anyone and they this view that Kyle them. has actually is, is basically my default view that I look at. The only other thing that I add in, um, Kyle, if you go to add pods in, uh, just add uh, configure pods at the top. Yeah. I'm sorry. Give me a second. I'm, my brain just stopped working. Click on the gear by the question mark. Thank you. Pod configuration. And one of the things people don't realize, you can add in um, open ticket lists. It's right there which will show you all other open tickets for this client. This is something that's very helpful because as you're working on tickets, you want to know what other tickets, duplicates or whatnot exist. Um, and you can also customize your pods to what you need from that window. So this layout that Kyle has actually, my open tickets go at the very top right above um, the, the ticket number and stuff right next to the company <laughs> generally. <laughs> And then I minimize it because what happens is when you first open the ticket, it loads everything on screen. And if it's minimized, it's not going to load it. If you need it, you can expand it and it speeds up uh, load time on the ticket, generally speaking. 
Um, but that's generally basically what I what my ticket looks like. And that makes it easy for me to see. I, I got my resources. I can see who's working on it. I can add people if I need to. Um, I can send add emails if I send notes uh, to the CC bar. And I can see everything on the discussion and notes directly from the screen I first opened up. And that's generally how uh, I'd like to work. But again, it's all it's all customizable to your preference, like Kyle was saying. Um, so you can hide or minimize or remove the pods that you don't need. And yeah, you can check that box that says, do not show this again. Um, and and that, that extra pod at the bottom will disappear. Okay, that, that, that's, uh, that, makes, that makes sense. Um, how do you go about when tickets come in? Mm -hmm. um, our particular kind of thing, we have a, a, a dispatcher look at the ticket first yep. and assign it to an appropriate resource. Uh, one of the things I've seen is the kind of this, the kind of the resource calendar where tickets get dragged onto it in the dispatch portal in in blocks. Um, now, how 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 do you manage that? With sometimes our engineers will take a phone call and they will deal with that ticket. Nearly the majority of the time, actually, when they get when they get that call through, how do you balance that with someone actually dispatching them tickets and so make sure that? the right tickets are being worked on. I would just assign someone a ticket. I wouldn't give them the, I wouldn't drag and drop in a block time. I would just right click assign. Um, if you're going to actually book someone for a time to go out or a time to remote support, that is when I would use the drag and drop and edit the time because you don't want to just randomly drop. Cause that shows up. If, if it's connected to outlook, it'll show up to their outlook calendar. It'll give them a notification and they may confuse the engineer for a second before they realize, oh, that didn't schedule this. I don't need to contact the client immediately. That, cause then I'm going to call right now. Um, and handle it and uh, have the engineer determine when they can best resolve that issue. Generally, that makes sense. I think I'll be working yeah. on a bit of a faulty assumption so that let people me, were using that dispatch portal to assign right. tickets. Let me, let, me, let me just add on to that a little bit. So the dispatch portal is something that ConnectWise likes to tote around as, oh, this is how you dispatch tickets. This is how you're supposed to do it. It is completely useless in terms of managing tickets. You cannot properly manage the pods, the times, the, the time frames, time slots through the calendar. The only good thing it tells you is at the top is what time each resource has left available. Now, there is two things that I'm going to change or at least add on for consideration to what Kyle said. Number one, when you actually schedule a ticket, you don't, I, we don't do it and I wouldn't do it from the calendar directly. Um, if you go back, Kyle, can you go back to the ticket view on the service board? Oh, sorry. I thought we didn't want to do the dispatch board. And if you go ahead and click on any, any schedule column, uh, on any of the schedules. Yeah. Just click on that. And what's going to end up happening is it's going to open up. Yep right there at the bottom of pane, it allows you to schedule the resource directly. Now the resource themselves, and this is what we do, the resource, the technicians themselves can look at their own calendar to see what they're supposed to be doing during that time period. It gives them a very easy view for themselves. From a manager standpoint, it does not give a great view because especially if you have double book tickets or tickets piling up, or like you mentioned, they take a phone call and add time onto a ticket during a period when you know they're supposed to be working on a ticket, how do you know what happened, right? Um, this is the best way to schedule someone. And then the calendar is like a view kind of what's going on. However, to change that a little bit within those last update or two ConnectWise released a new feature. If you go back to the dispatch portal or any calendar view, actually, if you look at the top right corner where it says display type top left corner, sorry, my bad. There you go. You can look at the, uh, sorry, never mind. You can't do it on the dispatch portal. Go to go to your normal calendar. Oh, swear to God. <laughs> you can look at schedules, or you can look at time, or you can look at time with schedule overlay, and you can go like any admin can go cycle through any text calendar and see how much time they're spending on a ticket versus how much time they're actually or what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and it'll overlay, overlay their time entries with the actual schedule for the day so you can actually manage and keep track. It's a recent change to manage. It wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. It does make it slightly easier to manage, but it's still not a perfect system. We still prefer to do directly scheduling from the ticket itself um, and assigning resources from the ticket itself. We almost never go into the actual calendar view. That's, that mm -hmm. answers quite a few questions, actually. Um, I'm for what may be a simple question. Okay. How do you know 
what engineer a ticket to what what tickets an engineer is working on at that particular ah, second. See, uh, Minnie and I have just worked through this issue, uh, and are continually working through this issue. So we have it set up to where an engineer can realistically work one, maybe two tickets at a time, um, and we base it off of ticket status. So we have a workflow of the ticket statuses that go from new to closed. And when I'm done revising the system, they'll be in order. So they'll go from new to assign to, uh, you know, work through the process in the dropdown itself um, to close is the final step. Um, and if you're actually working the ticket, we have a specific status called actively working. And if you're working that status, you go to that status and you can only enter time in an actively working status. Right, we restrict which statuses you can enter your time into. So you have to be in an actively working status in order to enter time, like Kyle said. We also have dashboards for the manager displayed in Grafana, specifically for manage, that display how many actively working tickets there are per tech. And if they start noticing, hey, this tech has 12 actively working tickets, what the hell is going on? Um, and that's how you stay on top of it to ensure that, hey, they're only supposed to be on two or three actively working tickets at a time. Yep. And then you have the, so, I mean, have, I'm waiting on, from Zendesk. It's, uh, they had the, the way they do it is so much simpler. They just have a, they have the, they have the face next to the ticket. Well, they have an icon that shows the face of the person that's working in a particular ticket. So you can work out which tickets are even open by the tech without having to rely on a status change. But I suppose that's one way of, Kind of getting around that. Just yeah, that and that we're getting time. getting by the you know an on hold status that some client you know because even though they have it, it's not really a very efficient, but it is their client portal for ConnectWise. Um, they can see the statuses for all the tickets they have available to look at, and if you put any status in an on hold status, they're going to be like they're going to call in and be like, "What's well, my ticket on hold?" Well, we're not actively working on it right this moment. We're still working on it. It's just there's no one specifically work. So we have an, a specific status for that called in progress, which lets the client feel relaxed that their ticket's actually being handled, but doesn't necessarily know if we're doing it now or not. Um, and this allows us to you know not upset our clients and to make sure that um, we know internally that, hey, we're still working on this. We're still researching it. We're still trying to develop solutions yeah. to the problem, but no one's actively touching it now. Um, How does Manage deal with... Can you just go into a ticket, Kyle? Yep. One of the biggest things that I'm struggling to get my head around is just how awful the display of those tickets is. It's 2019. I agree. HTML has been around. I agree. I was born. Why can we not have fully featured? It's yeah. Do, I, do we know why? Uh, so it is coming, yes. by the way. It is coming. It's a, it's it is coming. Um, it's so on the roadmap. The the issue is uh, partly related to um, when they modernized everything. Um, that's just one thing that didn't get modernized, um, because the the pods and the UI is relatively new. I think it's only maybe a year and a half old. Um, from the old old interface which was just serviceable but garbage um and the pods and the rearranging of stuff is you know relatively new with all that as well um they it's just it required a whole bunch of more code changes that they didn't necessarily want to do um at the time of redoing all the uis because they basically had to update every single individual section into a new ui and that was more important than um getting rich text format I think I've just, it's just, I just struggle to get mad around the like tickets are basically the core competency of this product as in everything revolves around the ticket. That's the, that's what ConnectWise, that's the ConnectWise mantra. If it's not in a ticket, it doesn't exist. It exists. Yep. Yeah. Yep. They've put zero effort into making the tickets, into making that ticket look and be part of the experience of actually dealing with a ticket. Um, a ticket on Zendesk is so much. It looks Inner. so much better. Um, it, it just does. I mean, Zendesk is an expensive you're, product. Zendesk is very good at what it does. But You're underlying a, a core issue I have with ConnectWise Manage. Um, 
Autotask did this much better, Kyle. I'm sorry. And it's actually something I bring up with with Connectorize guys, even even on our our channel, Gavin. I, I always yell at John, and be like, you know, the managed interface sucks. And he told me he's like, um, he's mentioned one time, don't hold your breath, but there are changes or something like that. Um, the there is somebody who created Kyle. Do you remember who that was? It, they created a custom pod uh, that was able to. Display it basically sent. It did a web a web call when the ticket was opened up, and it sent all information off to a custom service he built that returned back a view in HTML. Yeah. And um, we were able to see the tickets. Ticket updates, now, obviously, yeah. you don't want to use his server to do that because you're going to be offloading all your ticket stuff to do it. But for someone who has the time and ability, you, you are that. able to develop your own. And not just that, but you can develop anything to build in and tie into your ticketing. That's how Flexible manages, which is like the same thing as Automate. You know, there's a level so, of flexibility there that's unheard of in terms of what the platform can it's, do. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, Automate's getting there, but it's it's been more of a plug-in type system versus an API type system. You you right. you would write actual C-sharp code or VP.net code to interact with Automate, um, whereas any th- you deal with APIs um, with uh, ConnectWise Manage. Um, and before we get sidetracked again, um, the way to handle tickets that have not been updated by a tech in X hours, we don't do X hours, we do days. Um, and you can, uh, y- you have to look basically. Um, you, you have to, uh, keep on top of it. You can generate a report that'll show last updated when X days, but if anyone updates it within X days, it's, it's a problem. Um, so we have, we actually have, we have put some rules, um, for our ticketing. Like, this is a struggle for every help desk, right? And especially um, how to manage your, it's not just ConnectWise, it's any ticketing system, is how to manage your workflow for your techs. The key difference here is that it's a new platform for us when we first joined, and Gavin, for you, it's going to be a new platform. You have to work within the kinks of that platform. Um, we have multiple statuses for when tickets are in different statuses. <laughs> One of them is on hold, right, if a ticket's on hold. The problem we were seeing in our workflow was the tickets would go on hold. Um, the manager would follow up, hey, why is this ticket on hold? Once he had a reasonable explanation, it was never followed up again, right? And the ticket would sit on hold for seven days, 14 days, you know, until someone realized, hey, why is this ticket so old? What What's going on here? Um, additionally, we also had a waiting customer status, which is different than an on hold. And the waiting customer is where the customer has to respond and it was the same thing like, oh, the customer hasn't got back to us. So now it's just waiting, you know, three, four or five days. We created two different rules that rely on uh, two or three metrics. Number one is the status, right? We have for any ticket that's in a waiting customer status and the ticket is past due and the ticket has not been updated in the past day. Then the ticket gets changed back to in progress status and an email gets sent out to the technician assigned saying, hey, this ticket requires your, your attention again. Um, so then SLAs are no longer paused because the status is no longer waiting customer on hold and it's in progress and then the manager is paying attention to those tickets again. And that has significantly improved our response time on those tickets that were previously waiting customer and then just forgotten about. We do the same thing for on hold. The difference is for on hold ticket, we give a little bit more leeway time because we're not waiting customer, we're waiting for either hardware to arrive or something else to occur we give it three days past due as opposed to one day past due. And this is all doable using workflow rules, which increases the flexibility that Manage has. Um, and for those of you who've never seen a workflow, imagine SQL and then make it really difficult to do and understand. And then you have your workflow rules. <laughs> why, don't a, you, it, why don't you go to the... It's a GUI-based version of SQL. And uh, I prefer the old interface. Set up they tables. Used to have, um, oh, Under okay. system. I don't. I can't see that far, Mandy. Where the heck is it? There it's it is. On the bottom. Give me a second. I'm working this. You cannot have control. I don't want control. It's manage. I hate manage. Uh, I don't have workflow rules. You do. Don't filter for general. Just search for workflow rules. It's under service desk. No, oh, it is under general. I'm sorry. I'm used to having like 500 options under here. <laughs> so, I'm like, where'd they go? So these are what workflow rules look like. And I'll let Kyle finish talking. Because uh, he has control. 
<laughs> so the workflow, you get a description and you get a table reference. Um, you can reference multiple tables, project services, opportunities, um, configurations, companies. Um, and then you specify its location, business unit, service board, territory, depending on what you're actually selecting. Um, and since we're doing service tickets itself, we're, we're specifically only looking at the location, um, currently in Tampa office, the business unit, which is the department of professional services and the specific service board, professional services, anything else is not going to run on. If it's not in the help desk, it's not going to, if it's in the help desk, it's, it's not going to count to this. Well, let, let's, let's translate those values to something that makes sense to most people. So if you have multiple locations, which most offices would not, um, but let's say you have multiple offices with different service boards per location, uh, for people who have streamline it, um, clients, they have their own locations there. Right, so you want to run rules specifically under one client, out of not un, under the streamline IT. You would change the location to that client. Um, if you want it on the entire company, you would keep that at the root level, on the very top, uh, instead of just a specific location. The business unit would be something like, um, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing in there. Uh, it would be something like if you offer professional services to your customers, or if you offer uh, security services to your customer, or help desk services, or whatever that service you offer, they would each be listed as a specific type of service. If under they the have, business unit. depending on how they have that set up. Um, right. Most depending people split up their up. sections. Like they'll have a sales department, um, which right. department and business unit in this sense will be interchangeable. Um, anything with sales will go to the sales and then they'll have their service board for, uh, let's say they'll have a service board for uh, new purchases, a service board for uh, warranty expirations, a service board for, just, you know, stuff like that. And then you could do tickets that move workflows that move around. Um, so you can individually select boards and, and items like that. Um, but uh, this will show you a complete, this is a completed workflow rule. If I hit test, it's going to return nothing. Um, okay. Well, it returns stuff. There's tickets on that board. Evidently. So the the <laughs> rule is looking for any ticket that's open. And, and the ticket more, is more than 40 hours old. We actually have a, apparently 149 tickets that meet, so, that meet that rule. So this is a very basic explanation of what it is. If I click on this, this is the interface. And it looks pretty mild, um, but this is this is how it's it's worked out in SQL. So you have if ticket is open and if ticket is more than 40 hours old. Um, and you can do constraints. Um, we can do subqueries. Um, we can do and nots, ands, ors. So uh, the, because this is a specific ticket, um, we could do triggers based on that ticket. Now, n a lot of the time you will find what you need to do inside of here. The, there's a lot of triggers available, and while you may have to finagle how you want to word it properly, you will, should, as long as the trigger's here, you should be able to do what you want to do. Um, so it's... It, so let's say, for example, we wanted to check the status of a ticket. So you can just to... type status by the way, it'll filter. Yeah, no. So show them. I'm fine, Mindy. <laughs> so uh, if ticket is in value status, um, luckily you get a drop down menu of the status is available for the service board you're selected for. Um, if ticket is assigned, I'll save it. Oh, see. Yes, it forgot my end. I forgot my end. I'm sorry. I forgot my end. It doesn't look too ominous. No. Um, or um, let's do company ticket is for company. Blue light. Sounds good. Save. So we have six. Now if we click view results, it's gonna give me an Excel spreadsheet of those results. Which is unfortunately I just can't view them yet, which is one so of the that, drawbacks. I understand how that kind of limits the events. What kind of actions can you take against So um the run schedule you wanna do uh would be next thing I'd cover, just because it's it's here. So yep. this will check the event on each record it finds. So let's say it's got six. So with this currently, it's going to check every seven days and it's going to continuously run whatever action you have set every seven days. 
I'm not going to show them how to trigger a LaTeX script from ConnectWise. <laughs> That's Why a little not? bit more advanced than what we're going to discuss today. <laughs> it can be done. Um, I mean, so like what Kyle's talking about is we have the ability to have a customer email in a templated ticket, which provides the computer name in the subject line or body and also provides um, like keywords, install Adobe. And that ticket will actually cause a workflow rule to kick off that interfaces with Automate to grab that computer name and um, execute a script that will install Adobe based off of the, rule, the words inside the ticket. Yep. Um, so we're not going to do that because mostly because we don't actually have the automation, the integration set up right now. That's part of it. The other part of it is it is I'd like to go to bed tonight. <laughs> um, so, uh, as far as events, let's say you wanted to, uh, alert your text that you got a new ticket in, um, you would have set that frequency to once and just let it run because you obviously, if someone accidentally changes the status to new, you don't want them to get spammed with another ticket again, another email for the same ticket they just worked on. Um, if you, if let's say you wanted to email that a client, um, well, that's, that's a bad example because you can do that from the service board setup. Um, let's say you wanted to um, move a ticket from one status to another. Um, you can do that as uh, continuously um, and have it check for records every uh, minute. Don't do that. So a quick word on how workflows process minutes. Um while this says it will check every minute, it won't. It will check every five minutes. If it hap- if your database happens to be extremely tiny, you may get lucky and it may run prior to five minutes. But manage will always say make it five minutes because it won't run earlier than that on most systems. So, so they actually they actually tell you on cloud that your workflow rules should run every fifteen minutes oh, minimum. That's new. Um, for on-premise systems, you can go up, up as low as five, but it would really depend on your performance of the server, like Kyle said. The so other there's key- no there's no kind of schedule there that will run it as, as immediately as it happens. As it happens. No, really? no, this is one of my so biggest issues with workflow rules. Yes, um, you have two sections. You have when the workflow rule runs, and you have when the activity. Uh, when the actions are taken. So you can run the workflow every five minutes and then have the action only take part every seven days. So you're constantly checking for new tickets, but you only send an email out every seven days on the same ticket. Seems it would have made sense to yeah, trigger based the events into the actual trigger. Consider this how many times it's going to run on the same ticket. Think of it that way. Well, so the other thing I was going to say uh, before Gavin jumped in about the complaint, when you do these, let's say you do do every five minutes um, and your server is not necessarily the most powerful, but it is on-prem and five minutes is the minimum they tell you to do for on-prem server. What's going to end up happening if, if you actually get a large number of tickets caught in that rule and that rule does not finish running, if a cycle doesn't finish within five minutes, when that five minute limit gets hit, it stops the current cycle and reruns a new one. So you will end up actually missing emails or missing tickets from being hit until the next five minutes. Um, and we actually it took us a while to figure that out, but you'll actually see if you're running a rule every five minutes, it's not running every five minutes. It may run every 10 or 15, depending on how many emails are caught per cycle and whether or not the cycle can finish before the next five minute um, mark which is why they tell you the minimum for cloud is 15 minutes because they want to give you that buffer time for the cloud service systems, which are not necessarily more power, as power, uh, powerful enough to finish. They want to give that more time. And on-prem systems, as a general rule, five minutes is okay. But if you start noticing issues, they, they will tell you to increase it to 10. Yeah. And just, so, just to make sure this is, this is clear, um, the workflow time that the workflow runs is controlled by the activate mechanism. And the run schedule uh, is based on how many times it's going to run on the ticket and how often it's going to check if that ticket is new or basically if I check it, if check, if that uh, rule, yeah, if that rule applies to that ticket, um, it's going to basically like if it's a check every 15 hours, it's going to ignore anything that it's already checked 
for the previous 15 hours. So it's more of how many times do I run on this ticket? So if there's, let's say you're doing uh, an automated notification because the client hasn't updated your ticket in three days. So you do it uh, multiple times, uh, three, check every three days. So to a maximum of three times, every three days, it will do the action. And then after nine days, it'll stop. It'll stop. It won't count again. Um, that makes sense. So the actions you can do can be limited. Generally, you can send notifications. You can change the board. You can update a few things. It, it It's not a great deal of things you can do. Um, I was going to ask whether you could like do a webhook. But no. Clearly. Uh, no, it's not that uh, efficient, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, so in this case, let's, we can change the board. Um, we can set the board to professional services, a closed, uh, ticket type, and then we'll add another action. So then we'll assign a resource and we'll assign a specific member admin to, cause I don't like them. They're a horrible person. They cook fish in a microwave. When you get when you assign a resource to a ticket, what ends up happening is managers will prompt to send an email to that resource, letting them know the ticket's been assigned to them. Um, so what, that's what he's filling out right now is the email information that would be sent to that member, uh, admin two, when this rule gets fired, letting them know, hey, you got a ticket. Um, if you even when you manually assign tickets, that pop, that prompt will show up saying, hey, do you want to send an email now? What do you want to say in the email? If you close that ticket out, that prompt out, an email will not go out, uh, which most guys find annoying because they want to be told when a ticket's assigned to them. Um, just be on the lookout for that when that happens. So, uh, Wreck It Ralph, uh, if you want to do it every 24 hours, you can just do something like this continuously. Don't ever stop. Just do it every 24 hours. Um, um, that, that's really helped guys actually uh, in kind of giving an overview of the stuff that I wasn't I'm not really yeah and workflow rules are like after you get everything set up for those of you who haven't used managed before workflow rules are extremely powerful they'll help automate things in your business but they're more of a uh, I need this to happen without someone manually doing it it's it's you, you can't run metrics off of it like uh, I knew someone who ran their uh they had a service board set up where all their tickets were dumped to one board and then it would automatically move to their team boards separately. And so they had teams set up uh, in one, two, three. And if you're in company status one, you'd go to board one. If you're company status two, you go to board two. If company status three, you go to board three. And they had a metric they wanted to target for um, response time. They wanted to have their response time for all tickets uh, within 15 minutes, I think. Um, and they wanted critical uh, tickets to be responded within five minutes. So ConnectWise uh, workflows can take a minimum of five minutes generally to process. So if your target is five minute response time, one minute response time, you can't achieve that with workflows rules only because obviously they're not going to run in the time you want to target. So. And then if you so, have notifications for critical tickets to go out, those notifications could take up to five minutes as well. So you have a maximum of 10 minutes before your technicians are even notified there's a critical ticket on the board. So if I was to hazard a guess, uh, based on what you've shown me this evening, the people who are doing more advanced type things with that have requirements uh, with workflow are probably just custom writing something to integrate with the decent API. Do you reckon yes. that's right? Um, the, the automate API I did, uh, managed API, excuse me, um, the YouTube video that's available. Um, I, I believe I went over that where I, cause that's what, that's what I did. I used Python API to Python and the API, uh, to auto move tickets within 10 seconds. Um, search every 10 seconds, found a ticket, process ticket to where it goes based on the company status, pulled from the API, moved to the proper board via the API done. So we went from five to 10 minutes before it would workflow rule over 
um, to 10 seconds. So they could, it's actually achievable goal at that point. Right. So it all, it all, it really depends. It's, it's just like automate. You got to find the best tool for the job and depending on what you want, you have to work. It's also heavily dependent on your, on your business workflows, right? Yep. You got to build your workflows based off of what you're able to do and how much time you're able to spend on each specific type of tool that you can get. Yeah. Um, For example, we like in telecom, we don't do five minute or 15 minute response times guaranteed via email. It just doesn't happen. We, We even tell our customers, if you have a critical ticket, don't email it in, call it in. If you want to email it in, that's fine, but call it in too let us know because we're not going to see it fast enough in order to respond necessarily. It's a shame, isn't it though, when it comes to uh, things like that, 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 that ability is just not there. Right. Yeah. Um, but it, it's also based on limitations of the software that's running it. Um, it it's a GUI based version of uh, an internal monitor for lab tech, but it doesn't just report data. It also, acts on that data um like a script does so for processing a whole bunch of tickets in five minutes i think it does a pretty good job i do think some of the actions you can do um are limiting as well as some of the action or some of the triggers that you can uh pull up and base the rules off of are limiting but i do think it's uh for what it does i think it's a great system um so we have a question from Forrest Gump, whether okay. or not it's possible to uh, combine tickets within no. a workflow rule. You cannot merge tickets. Yeah, I think the answer is no, unfortunately. Uh, tickets are not able to be combined via workflow rule. It has to be done manually. Um, or, or you can use the API to search for tickets matching the same string, same customer, and then combine uh, those tickets together. Yeah, you could do it. with. Uh, I believe you can do it via the API. Um, I know you can set a parent ID uh, four tickets. So I'd assume you could do it that way. Um, it'd be bundling. I don't think you can merge via the API. Um, I'd have to look that up, uh, but I, I know you'd be able to bundle. Um, but I mean, workflow rules are, again, it's the, the tool for the job. It's a basic entry level on how to make things automated inside manage. And I've done a whole lot with workflow rules, a whole lot, a massive amount of things that you wouldn't think were possible. Um, it just depends on how much user interaction you can do and how much, uh, it, how you solve the problem. Um, it may not be exactly how you planned it initially. Um, but if you alter what you, as long as the end goal is the same, you can work through and get just a bunch, just as much probably done through the workflow rules without having to go to the API as possible. So we are a half hour or so over our schedule. And I know Gavin would love to go to sleep over in the UK. Um, and Kyle is planning his bedtime. And I'm already asleep. What are you talking about? And he's already asleep, as you can tell from the sleepy voice. Uh, so unless anyone has any further questions, we are going to wrap this up. Although it looks like everyone's quiet. Pretty much. I mean, it's been a pretty chill stream. We've been talking a lot, um, but we'll, we'll have some time to filter in the questions. Uh, for those who weren't on the initially, um, 99, uh, we have one person uh, who's attempting to go, but we're all slated to go to Automation Nation, also known as IT Nation Explorer. Um, I wonder if we could tie neural networks into processing automate stuff. I think automate's too buggy for a neural network. It would it would corrupt the neural network and we'd get like Satan neural network inside of our automate. I don't think that'd be a good idea. Um, but uh, I'm pretty sure um, the entire uh, admin staff will be at Automation Nation, IT Nation, uh, Explore this year, uh, 2019 in June. Um, for those of you who are coming, uh, we'd love to chat with you, hang out with you, high five, um, help us make fun of each other. Um, as is tradition as the admin team. We might wear shirts, but we are not vendors. Uh, well, I'm a vendor. <laughs> vending these jokes out. Boris <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gump, um, if, if they had neural networks 
Uh, it would be less Skynet, more Cortana. Oh, God. No, Tay. <laughs> what is it? Microsoft Tay? Do Cortana you... back with Windows Search. No, do you know, have you ever heard of Microsoft Tay? No. Microsoft no, Tay was a web API that was a neural network and uh, would answer they questions. Shut it down. They had to shut it down because of the corruption. It learned it because of the corruption it got from the internet. Yep. Um, it, it was exposed to the internet for like, what, a day? And yes. it started making racist Holocaust jokes or something? They shut it down. Immediately. Racist Holocaust jokes. <laughs> like, it was like, Within, what the it was, it, it's a great story. You should look it up. Um, <laughs> It shows while they haven't put it back up. On, I think it may be enabled now, but it's like it doesn't learn anything anymore because it did be unsafe. Um, I think someone asked for like the president of the United, a picture of the president of the United States, and it showed a gorilla with uh, the girl from SNL, the African American lady from SNL who was in the Ghostbusters movie, with her face overlaid of it, something like that. If I remember correctly, it's been a while. That was a couple years ago, but um, yeah, it was that's, a wild story. That's Microsoft. Don't, don't let kids on the internet. And don't let AI be developed by Microsoft. Um, I'm surprised it didn't blue screen trying to return that search query. To be honest. So, um, All right, guys. We have no questions. And I've got to go eat dinner. It was uh, great seeing you all. Hopefully to get your feedback on what else you want to hear on these casts. Maybe more on ConnectWise Suite. I know Kyle always loves talking about manage. I love um, talking about anything that's time. not automate because I actually like anything that's not automate. Um, because automate has scorned me for life and I don't know if I'll ever recover. Um, Harry, the, the, uh, we have a YouTube channel and the videos are posted on the YouTube channel. So you can go back to previous uh, postings. We, we also started posting these geek casts on MSP geek form. Uh, so that's there as well. Probably. Yeah, everything's on YouTube um, that we have uploaded uh, or that we've recorded. Um, I think one episode didn't make it, but it was just a, a quick testing session that me and Tyler um, way back when, when we were hanging out. Nothing. It wasn't anything important. Um, I think that's the only episode that didn't actually make it to YouTube. Um, I may still have the recording, uh, but everything else is on YouTube if we've recorded it. So there's um, uh, all the episodes of the geek cast event up there as well as the, the first one with the API, the second one, which was the, uh, testing stream. And then the third one with Kyle from Huntress labs. And then we had a couple There's more. There's a fantastic one with Kyle from Huntress labs. Not only because his name is Kyle, but because he's really genius. Because the, le the, the cast was actually good and educational. Man, I learned so much from that. I, I will never forget how they injected data and how he just went through and was like, yeah, they just go into the command prompt and then they execute another he used, command. He used, uh, I think it was a printer driver to execute a remote command to install or download a file. Um, and he showed just by installing a printer, boom, you're infected. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really great. Uh, and uh, he has an application. He has a, a this, this was a non-sponsored stream. But um, <laughs> non -sponsored this is non -sponsored. Oh, you should check out his product. Hunter's his product <laughs> is really cool. Um, we use it internally at our company, so uh, it's it's really nice. Um, we like it. It does what we expect it to. Um, so. Okay. Thank All you, right. everybody, and good night. I'll shut it down.